Hello there, and welcome to the last video on trilobites. This makes me a little bit sad. I realised uh, when I was doing this how much I like trilobites, and uh, then got really sad that they're extinct. True story. Um, so, uh, we're going to spend the last video uh, learning about why arthropods are useful to geologists. I think this is really important to do for every group that we look at, and this is why I think it's really important that we teach you um, these um, topics as part of a geology degree. And also, um, we will start off by um, focusing on what these things actually look like in a rock. So I'm sure you've seen um, the beautiful fossils that I, I um, have provided in the 3D models and how wonderfully preserved they are. That's great if we're interested in learning about the anatomy of trilobites and what these creatures were like. That doesn't help you so much if you want to know what they actually look like when you find them in a rock, because often the fossils that we find are highly fragmented and abraded. Um, and so we'll, we'll have a quick look at that, that to give you a quick idea and also look at what they look like in cross section um, because sometimes you'll see them in slides of sedimentary rock. So without further ado, let's find out what do trilobites look like in a rock? So, yeah, it's a bit underwhelming, isn't it? Certainly compared to, um, to some of the fossils that I've been showing you, this is how trilobites will typically appear in a rock if you find them. Um, something like this, um, uh, a picidium, represents a bit of the exuvia, the, um, the multidexter skeleton of one of these animals, probably. I mean, it could have been an animal that died and rotted and separated, but odds are it's um, a, a multidexter skeleton that separated. Um, and those are really quite common. You find the odd picidium, the odd head. And often when you break open the rock to look at um, a surface, you, you won't break along a useful surface on that. So you'll have what you can see on the right here, which is a cross section through a bit of a trilobite. So you can see they've got this distinct three lobed appearance in cross section that actually really helps you um, identify one of them. The other key thing is that uh, trilobite exoskeletons are made of calcite and they're really quite chunky. That allows you to, at a glance, say, okay, that's probably a bit of trilobite. Um, sometimes if you're lucky, you get a bit of a, a head that's actually identifiable in terms of its morphology sticking out of the rock. And a trilobite expert can probably tell you um, roughly what species that is based on that small bit of the anatomy. So bear that in mind. So, um, I wanted to reiterate because they molt. One trilobite can be um, responsible for a significant number of fossils representing the uh, XUVA. Um, so bearing that in mind, when you you can often find kind of collections of bits of trilobites, um, which probably represent um, the concentration of those XUVA. So it's not necessarily unlikely that you'll find lots of bits of trilobite in a single rock. This is in section what a trilobite looks like in a rock. So the um, carapace uh, or the, the exoskeleton of these things is made of calcite crystals orientated perpendicularly to the exterior of the exoskeleton. Um, this means that they show typically undulose extinction patterns within a slide and occasionally you can see some layering in the exoskeleton. You can see a, a nice example of a cross section of trilobite here. Again, you can recognize them from that um, trilobed appearance and another one marked by this yellow arrow here. And bear in mind, I've, I've put a field of view for you here to get an idea of the size. So that's what trilobites look like in the third section. So why have I spent all of this time um, covering trilobites for you over the course of these videos? First off, I think it's really useful to know, if you're looking at a uh, fossil of trilobite, you know that the rock you're looking at is Paleozoic, right? We know from this graph. These organisms did not ex exist after the Paleozoic. And you can more specifically say, if you don't really know much about the area you're in, the odds are better that it's a lower Paleozoic rock, i.e. Cambrian or Divisional Silurian, than it is a upper Paleozoic rock, so kind of Carboniferal or Permian. Increasingly unlikely that you'll find a trilobite. Also, you can say for Ding Dang Shaw that this is a marine rock. It was deposited in a marine setting, right? So that's really, really useful. Um, but furthermore, trilobites are useful in a range of different um, contexts in lower Paleozoic rocks. Benthic trilobites, those that lived on the seafloor, were capable in li of living in environments that ranged from fairly uh, shallow waters inshore to fairly deep waters. 
In many cases, particular taxa, so genera or even families, favoured particular parts of the continental shelf, shelf or slope um, to live in. So in other words, each of these groupings has a tolerance range and the tolerance range of individual um, species and groups can overlap, allowing us to draw continuous profiles um, around paleo continents, subdivided into numerous integrating but generally discrete habitat belts. So these will run concentric around a continental margin in a Paleozoic ocean. This can provide insights into the environment of deposition of a Paleozoic rock. For example, its depth, its substrate, um, its temperature, turbulence and oxygenation will all impact on kind of the community that you get um, within any given um, environment. Our interest, you can actually see some of the kinds of trilobites on this diagram associated with depths in one particular instance of um, Paleozoic trilobite assemblages, which you can read more about in the source that I've put on the bottom here. I think it's really interesting. Uh, I, we don't have time to go into it as part of this lecture, but if you are interested, I would highly encourage you to do that reading. The same is true of the traces of these animals. So um, every now and then um, an animal will be walking on a sediment and it will create a trace that then gets preserved in the fossil record. Uh, these will tell you uh, an awful lot about the rock. The study of trace fossils is actually called ichnology. And trace fossils are themselves organized into categories, ichnotaxa. So much like we organize um, the living world into species, we can kind of do a similar thing with trace fossils. And onshore to offshore gradients in trace fossils exist um, from intertidal environments all the way down to the deep sea. Those kind of gradients uh, these are these are kind of like a, again the same idea as different kind of collections of species of trilobites. Um, we get collections of um, species of trace fossils called ichnotax, sorry ichnofacies I should say, collections of different trace fossils associated with um, different sediment conditions and depths, for example. Four main ichnofacies associated with depth that you can see on the um, diagram shown here on the left that you may want to know about are skeletos. So this is generally a high energy condition um, ichnofacies associated with moving and well sorted sands. Then there is cruziana. This is best developed below the normal fair weather wave base. So it's a little bit deeper. You may be looking at like an estuarine lagoonal or shelf environment. But the reason I, I'm mentioning all of this is this is named after cruziana, which is an animal walking trace shown on the right. You can see a 3D model of that below this video. Um, in Paleozoic rocks, this is primarily made by trilobites. Bear in mind that any particular species of trace fossil could be made by a range of different groups. And, and Cusiana, for example, could be made by any group of arthropods that has these limbs either side of a midline walking through a bit of sediment. But in the Paleozoic, that will often be because of trilobites. So that's the link to our trilobites here. Um, Zuvikos is a ichnofacies associated with quiet water, presumably with adequate nutrient conditions. So we're talking kind of like an upper continental slope type thing. And then we've got one called the Neriites ichnofacies. This is a quiet but moderately well oxygenated environment, seabed, kind of getting towards deeper waters. So I'm mentioning this both because trilobites are key to that cruciana, but also because this is some nice, useful background knowledge for you. You don't need to remember all of these words or all of those faces or even what makes them up, but knowing they exist, knowing you can use trace fossils to uh, tell you something about the um, environment of deposition of your rock, be it the depth or the substrate conditions, is just a really useful bit of your toolkit as a geologist. So maybe remember that fact. Um, all of these are kind of collections of a range of different conditions, be that turbulence, sedimentary, sedimentation rate, the availability of food and oxygen concentration. So unpicking those different influences that is actually quite difficult. Um, and so some people have criticized this idea of ichnofascies. So be aware that in terms of the research, there are arguments regarding um, the usefulness of these categories, but nevertheless, I wanted to point out they exist. 
I also want to highlight that um, beyond, above and beyond kind of that idea of uh, using these ignofascists to tell you about the sentiment, we can build up some really complex pictures about past environments and past climates by using collections of fossils. Environmental conditions are very different in continents lying, say, at high latitudes, as opposed to those lying near the uh, tropics. So as an example, in the early Ordovician, um, we, we had two paleo continents called Laurentia and Siberia, which you can see here. Um, Siberia is nowadays found. The rocks are now somewhere near where Siberia is, right? Laurentia has gone on to form uh, bits of a number of different continents. But we can say based on the uh, fossils that these were in the tropics. And a large segment of the early southern continent Gondwana was lying near the South Pole. So it would hardly, surpri hardly surprise us that trilobites we may recover from sandstones or shales, say in Morocco, which was in kind of a polar Gondwana, are completely different from limestones in tropical Laurentia, say. So we start building up this picture of, of what paleo continents were doing. And as such, trilobites um, and the fact that they have a, this discrete um, distribution, you get a package of trilobites associated with the continent, have been used extensively in reconstructing paleo continents and telling us something more about the nature of those continents and their climates, such as, and for example, their position. This is a field called paleobiogeography, and trilobites are particularly useful for this in the Cambrian, the Ordovician, and the Silurian. And indeed, by integrating studies of what for where fossil trilobites are found and what they look like, their evolution, and what we know about their paleoecology, coupled with other lines of evidence, can allow us to do some really cool things. The example here is from a paper that integrates all of those things in order to test the interaction between the migration of trilobites, the speciation within lineages of trilobites, and their extinction rates. And this shows that the paleocurrents that were around at this time in an ocean more than uh, 450 million years ago, um, played a significant role in the regional distribution of the communities of trilobites. So all of that from studying all of these different um, elements of the fossil assemblages. Isn't that cool? Paleocurrents impacting on fossil collections in rocks that are that old. I think that's really awesome. I hope you do too. The final thing I wanted to highlight and this is really important. And I'm going to come back to this in group after group. And I'm going to start off by highlighting it in the trilobites is that fossils are used to date rocks, right? This is really important. Fossils date rocks. Yeah. This is something that's called biostratigraphy. And I've put a definition of biostratigraphy on this slide here. It's a branch of stratigraphy that involves the use of fossil organisms in the dating and correlation of the stratigraphic sequences of a rock in which they are discovered. A zone is the fundamental division recognized by biostratigraphers. It's a lot of words there. But in, uh, another way of putting this is the, the organization of sedimentary successions is based on biological events and their records in the rock. Fossils can correlate and date rocks. It's important because rock units from um, the same period, say, may be different rock types and may end up geographically separate, but the fossils found within them can be used to correlate across time continents. At the same time, a particular kind of sandstone could be deposited 4.1 billion years ago, theoretically. Probably not, that's a bit old. Maybe let's say 3.6 billion years ago, ago for the oldest kind of like typical sandstone. In fact, yeah, a continental um, crust wasn't around 4.1 billion years ago. So ignore that statement. But anyway, a sandstone caused by a degrading continent could be from before the Cambrian explosion or it could be from after the Cambrian explosion, and the fossils will tell us that. So the rock type alone doesn't tell you the age of the rock, but the fossils in it do. So in these images, um, this is an example drawn from the Triassic ammonoids, which are shown on the left. We'll learn all about these in another one of these videos, which allow us to be um, to build a local sequence of evolution within these taxa um, based on where we find different collections of these species within a rock. Uh, in any given local environment. That's what's shown in the middle here. 
And then that can be compared to global deposits to build up a broader picture of how um, different lineages evolve throughout the geological column. And indeed, amongst the finest examples of biostratigraphy is the geological column as a whole. This is entirely based on fossils um, when it was first constructed. It was only with the advent of radiogenic dating that we were able to calibrate it with actual numbers relative to millions of years. So each one of these divisions, the major ones, the minor ones, all of that was based on the fossil assemblages that were within a rock, and that was biostratigraphy. So Biostrat is really useful for dating sedimentary rocks. Um, radiometric, sorry, radiogenic dating only really works with volcanics. And so kind of like the fossils are what we use to date sedimentary rocks. And I'll be feeding information about biostrophy in throughout um, this bit of the course. And trilobites are key to the biostrophy of the lower Paleozoic in particular, but the Paleozoic as a whole. Um, you can see um, the relationships and the evolution of the major groupings of trilobites in this beautiful diagram on the left that is uh, used courtesy of SM Gon the third. In brief, by correlating the groups of species found together and how they overlap, we can then build up a clear picture of any fossil um, assemblage in a rock. And this is known as the principle of formal succession. I've put an, an alternative um, definition of that on the slide here. Um, so if we do this with trilobites, um, we can use the trilobites or the collection of species of trilobite that are in any given rock to understand where it lies in the succession of different trilobites. This fundamental unit, the zone, the biozone is usually named after one particular taxon. And in the lower Paleozoic, these are often based on the trilobites that you find in the rock. So that's what's shown um, in the diagram on the right here. The exact details don't really matter to you here, but what does is interesting to note is that there are zones based on different um, major divisions of the trilobites. And so trilobites are really, really important when it comes to untangling the age of these really old rocks. And that brings me to the end of the videos for trilobites. Bear in mind that this, these ones have been a bit longer than many of the other ones will be because I've actually introduced some concepts that we will revisit um, kind of that are overarching and, and go between fossil groups. So if you didn't follow any of the kind of the methodological um, bits, things like biostrophy, don't worry that we will, we will come back to those, but we won't be visiting trilobites again. So if you have any questions about trilobites or, or the arthropods more generally, um, your opportunity to ask these is in our next Zoom session. So please do write down any questions that you have at this point and make sure that you ask them in that session. In the meantime, I will thank you for your attention. Um, have a quick look at the model below this point. And then when you go back to Blackboard, there'll be a quiz which will allow you to test your knowledge. You may want to, to, to kind of have a, a leave it a few days, uh, revisit your label diagram and make sure you've got those, those terminology, those words uh, kind of down and you know how they relate to each other and then have a go at sitting the quiz. Otherwise, I will see you when we next meet on Zoom. Thank you for your time and attention.